everyone and welcome to today's Lunch and Learn. My name is Kristen Hewitt. I'm a television reporter here in South Florida and it is Congenital Heart Defect Awareness Week. So today we're talking about congenital heart defects. Did you know 40,000 babies are born with one every year? And in the first six months of life, 25% of those babies will need some sort of surgery or catheterization, catheterization, say that the right way, to help them. And who helps with that? Well, that's Dr. Alan Megan's job. He is a pediatric and adult congenital interventional cardiologist here at Joe DiMaggio Children's Hospital, and he's going to break down the ABC. So first of all, thank you for being here. We oh, appreciate thanks. you spending your lunch with us. Sure. Thank you, Chris. I really appreciate it. It's an honor to be here. Uh, we should have had lunch delivered. Maybe See, yes. Maybe next time we'll do that. But before we get started, I just want to remind the audience that if you know anyone that has a congenital heart defect or a parent going through this with a newborn baby or a child, or you might know an adult, Please share this broadcast, please tag them, and you can also ask questions. Dr. Legan is here, he's gonna lend us his expertise for the next 25, 30 minutes. So let's uh, utilize his brain while we can. Okay, so let's let's break this down. We hear about congenital heart defects all the time in the news now. It seems to be more and more common. So how common is this, and what what is a congenital heart defect? Sure, so I think the best way to start, congenital heart disease, or we'll call it CHD, is, is heart disease that you're born with. And so it's, it's not an acquired heart disease. A lot of us, when we hear cardiology, we think of adult heart disease and heart attacks and plaques in your coronaries. It's very different. So these are, for the vast majority, are things that babies and children are born with. And so it spontaneously happened whenever their heart was forming inside of mom's womb. <clears throat> and to your point on the question of is it related, sometimes it can be genetic related, that's a small subset. For the most part, this is something spontaneous. Nothing that the parent was exposed to, or the mom ate or drank or anything like that. That's a very rare thing to be connected. It's truly just a spontaneous defect. But <clears throat> congenital heart disease is, is a very wide spectrum of disease. And given that, it's, it can span things from even a hole or multiple holes in the heart to abnormal valve or valves in the heart to even some children are born with only half of a heart. And so it, it can be quite the spectrum of disease. And it's your job to fix that, but how, I mean, how common is this? How many babies are you seeing with this? I mean, it, it seems like it's something, is this the most common birth defect? It is, correct. So you, you mentioned some of those great statistics to remember is that this is the most common birth defect. and. In that, so about one out of every hundred children will have some form of congenital heart disease or CHD. And granted, that's a wide spectrum, but, uh, but that's, it, a, that's a big number. It's I mean, a very one big one in that hundred. Yeah. Right? yeah. So uh, as you mentioned, about forty thousand children a year, and so within those forty thousand or so uh, babies, twenty-five percent of those will need either a cath or a open heart surgery within the first six months of their life. And so it's, it is very common, and it is something that everyone needs to be thinking about and aware of, because this is a very unique population. So how do we become, we become aware of that? You know, here on the Facebook page and on Joe DiMaggio Children's Hospital social media, we'll share stories of children that have had heart surgeries, but how does a parent know? Is this something that you can diagnose during a pregnancy, or is it something that you notice after birth, or is it whole? Great question. So there is several types of heart disease that we do pick up. Sometimes whenever the mom is getting a prenatal ultrasound, when they, when they do the little ultrasound on her belly, sometimes you can catch some of these uh, lesions or defects that we see. A lot of them we don't. So uh, to answer your question, if you don't catch it prenatally, then of course once the child is born, there can be various things that they're based on their underlying CHD that they have, but some of the more common things is they can be very discolored and not have a normal oxygen level when they're breathing. They can also have trouble feeding and, and taking in their formula, which is the biggest exercise any baby does is eat, and so they might have trouble with that because their heart isn't uh, able to help them do that. And then. For the most part, most congenital heart defects are picked up within the first year of life because of that, of things like not being able to eat, and also lack of weight gain, another big thing that's very important in babies. What about fainting? Because that would be a hard mm -hmm. I've heard that babies have, can faint, but it might be yep. hard for a parent to know the difference between a nap and a faint, right? Absolutely. And certainly, uh, to back up a little bit, to some of those CHD that develop later in life and you acquire, somewhat acquire, there are some children that can first present with fainting, and that should be something that certainly if a parent uh, has a child that 
that has fainting for some reason that's not easily identifiable, that's very important to be evaluated by, uh, by your pediatrician and then may need to escalate to a pediatric cardiologist. So you just said something that we were maybe going to get to later, but I want to ask it now. You sure. said that it could develop later. So yeah. what is the, so you know we're talking about babies that are born with this, and you know, in a, a large chunk of those need surgery or interventions early. Correct. But how does it develop later? Well, it's it's not so much that those subtypes develop later. It's just that they in that big spectrum of congenital heart disease. Maybe they're just more subtle, and we don't pick it up until later in life. And so, because we're not going to do a full cardiac evaluation on every single baby that's born, nor should we, to be honest right, with you, because right. that would be a huge burden on the healthcare system, <laughs> and, and you get a lot of false positives. But, you know, some congenital heart defects, because they're mighty subtle or they don't create a lot of symptoms, it's difficult for them to come to light. And so, it's always something that pediatricians are thinking about that. That, oh, maybe this could be heart disease, but again, as we spoke about, most of it can be picked up in the first year of life, um, for sure. Okay, so we're talking about congenital heart defects. Um, you're an interventional cardiologist, yes, so I'm, I'm assuming that interventional means that you're doing some sort of interventions on these babies. So let's talk about treatment. So a baby Absolutely. is born with a hole, a baby is born with half of a heart you come in, these are very tiny babies, so what are some of the treatments, what are some of the options, what are some of the things that you're doing now? A great question, and again, it, it speaks to the spectrum of CHD, but some CHD will just be followed by a pediatric cardiologist, and that can even resolve certain subsets of congenital heart disease can. Some will need some medicines while they resolve, and then you start moving into some kids that need an intervention or, or a catheterization. So that's little plastic tubes going into vessels, say in the leg or the neck or the arm, and going into the heart and being able to perform interventions through those tubes. So minimally invasive is the way I think of it. And then you keep going to some children that might necessitate open heart surgery. And that's where my surgical colleagues come in, where they actually have to open the, the rib cage and stop the heart and surgically correct uh, defects that are present. And to be honest with you, some, some anatomies, we know that they will ultimately need a heart transplant. That, that's just truly the prognosis and the fate of uh, some anatomies. And so our job is to get a child or a baby big enough and old enough to be able to receive a heart and, and undergo the heart transplant. What, is there a certain age that you're trying to get them to? I'm just curious. It, yeah, it don't, totally depends on the diagnosis, right. so I don't mean to head on that. No, but it, uh, it, it just, the, the reality is that heart transplant, those donor hearts are very limited in resource, right? And so uh, if you were to put a baby, a brand new baby on the heart transplant list, they might, they might not make it uh, while waiting on the right. heart. And so if we can do these surgeries and these catheterizations to, to palliate or to help them grow and get bigger to adults that they have a lot better chance of making and, and receiving a heart transplant at one, at one point. And each diagnosis can be wait because you want to wait to do that heart transplant so you have to, but it, it's a balance. So this yeah. is certainly disease that needs to be followed lifelong now uh, in all subsets. And so I think that's an important point. Yeah, so, and we, and I know that you do that because you're not only a pediatric cardiologist, but your title says pediatric and adult. So sure. how does, how does that work? How, I mean, do you work on both patients or, or do you just follow them into adulthood? Absolutely. So I think this is a really important thing to understand about the congenital heart disease population. And um, as of 2016, the CDC confirmed that there's actually more people walking around this nation who are above 18 years of age who have congenital heart disease than below 18. Wow. And, that, and that makes a little bit of sense because A, uh, the, the number of CHD born each year, it's, it's fixed, right? But we have gotten so good as a field and have been able to provide therapies and options for patients that over the past, say, 40 to some odd years, we've gotten so much better that these congenital heart disease patients are living longer. So the adult congenital population, I mean, it's exponentially growing because every year that goes by, it's the same amount of CHD babies that are born, but now they're moving older and older. And so for the vast majority of congenital heart disease, whether it needs intervention and surgery, those need to be followed for a lifelong um, span because there are certain things that you need to be thinking about in that fragile patient population. And Really, we're just trying to ensure that they have the longest and best quality of life. And so, 
Uniquely here at Joe D. and Memorial, we have an adult congenital heart disease center. In fact, we're the only nationally accredited ACHD center uh, here in South Florida. And so we have a huge team and, and resource group, including myself, who, who I'm board certified in adult congenital heart disease, who help take care of this population. Don't let his Georgia hat pull you out. <laughs> He's still a Florida guy. Okay, you so go. you just talked about getting these babies to a longer life expectancy. Yes, so what is the life expectancy of a child born with THC, or does that depend on each situation with the patient? I mean, is that, is that too hard to answer? It, it certainly depends on the diagnosis and then also other medical issues that, that the baby may have. Um, but again, uh, we as a field have gotten have just made leaps and bounds of advancements over the past decades to really kind of advance this and allow children to have their longest and best quality of life. And um, I think that you know the vast majority of congenital heart disease patients are able to live a, a long and best quality of life because of that. Got it. Okay, we were talking about treatments before, mm -hmm. and I know that they have captured you doing surgery recently. Yeah. Uh, we've seen the PDA closure in sure. the news. Can you tell us a little bit about what that is? Yeah, so a, a PDA is a vessel that we all have when we're inside of our moms. In fact, it's crucial for our development while we're in the womb. And there's two vessels that come off the heart. One goes to the lungs, one goes to the body. And that PDA connects those. Now in all of us, once we were born, that PDA just spontaneously closed. But in certain populations, that PDA just happens to stay open. Again, not necessarily anything that they're exposed to, but right. most of the time it just happens. And it's very common in the premature infant population. So babies that were born too early, right, and didn't make it to the full 40 weeks of gestation. And so if, if that, those patients who already have immature lungs from not, let's say, being in the oven for long enough, <laughs> if they have immature lungs and they have a PDA, the PDA can provide a lot of excess blood flow to these immature lungs. They can make them very, very sick, and they're very small, and they're very fragile, and they're all in breathing machines, and, and the PDA is really detrimental to already immature lungs. Now, years ago, and, and as of recently, the only option for that was to do a surgical procedure where you spread the rib cage, and a surgeon goes in and places a clip to close the PDA. We have some really amazing technology now to be able to go through the leg vessel of tiny children. In fact. Some of the smallest that we do are even one, one pound, three ounces. So These 600 premature. grams, premature, yeah. tiny babies, and be able to navigate up through the heart and go into the PDA to place the device and to completely occlude the PDA and not allow that blood flow to go into the lungs and make the baby sick. And it really helps these premature infants to get off the breathing machine and really kind of advance forward and grow and do everything that they need to do. That's incredible. I can't wait to see the video on that. We are getting some questions, so thank you for those of you who are asking questions. Nicholas asked, so as I'm looking at my phone, I just want you to know sure, I'm yeah. answering the questions. Nicholas wants to know how many CHDs are there? Is there a specific number? It, so it's a good question, Nicholas. There is there is quite the spectrum, and to make it even more confusing, you say you and I have the same congenital heart disease diagnosis, even within that diagnosis you can have different subset groups. So it's, it's quite a wide range of, of um, disease as well as because it's such a wide range it, they need to necessitate a wide range of treatment. And so it's not really helpful to probably give you a number of different CHDs, right, right. but just know there's, there's many, many, many types. So. And, and he asked about the frequency, and we said at the beginning of the broadcast mm -hmm. that you said one in every hundred children. One in every hundred children will have some form of congenital heart disease. Now, 25% of that one in 100, so breaking it down a little more, will need something, a catheterization from someone like myself or an open heart surgery in the first six months of life. I got it. Um, I have a couple more for you that were planned, but I was just thinking, as you were talking about the PDA as a mother, I can't sure. imagine sending my infant in for a heart surgery. So yeah. what do you say to parents, like maybe there are parents watching right now sure. who have just had a child diagnosed with this, you know, you know, what do you say to them? It's got to be hard to explain it, but there's got to be, as you're saying, there's great technology. You've got a lot of good treatments. You know, how do you um, put them at ease? Absolutely. And 
being a father myself, I, I could not imagine handing their child, my child over to someone and trusting in them. So I, I truly treat it as an honor every time a parent does that for me. And, uh, and I just think that we have really come so far in our treatment of congenital heart disease that we, we have really good options now. And I think that, again, understanding that this can be a lifelong disease. Some heart, congenital heart disease can self-resolve. Some people, children, adults will need multiple catheterizations and procedures throughout a life. And so really kind of sitting down and helping the patient parents understand what the life of a person with congenital heart disease looks like. And then even most importantly, helping them understand that our number one goal as pediatric cardiologists is to provide them the longest and best quality of life. We don't want them to live in a bubble. And that is not how we want our CHD patients. In fact, I always tell my parents that if, if I'm called down to the ER because my heart patient has broken his arm playing outside, well then I've done my job. I, I think that that's fantastic. So, you know, our biggest goal as pediatric cardiologists is to really ensure that these kids live the best, best quality of life that they, they, they can live up in, as long as they can. How has COVID affected these patients? Uh, yeah, just like all of you, I'm sure, watching and, and everyone here, no matter what you do, we've all been affected by this pandemic, and it is it is very difficult. Um, there's certainly, we've gotten a lot of calls, um, and we've had to delay things because of COVID, but we are certainly pushing on and giving the patients uh, the care that they need. But we have to do it in a unique way, just like all of us. We have to really kind of figure out this is the new reality. And so our CHD patients, they are as, as strong as ever. I really, uh, these parents, these patients, they go through so much and they are truly warriors. And so uh, everyone's been flexible and we, you know, we've been able to do what we need to do. But certainly, uh, Certain congenital heart defects are a little more at risk if they were to get COVID, so it's very important that we all stay healthy, wash our hands, get vaccinated. Wear our masks like we're wear doing our masks, today. Yep. <laughs> we're a little muffled, but it's important to wear your mask. Yep. Um, okay, so you talked about handing your child over, but this has got to be so rewarding for you. What is what the best part of, of this job for you and getting to work with these families? Absolutely. Well, I think other than being called down to say, oh, a child's had a broken arm and he's playing and, and just knowing that these children and these adults are living their full life. I think for me specifically with my specialty of cath is there, as I mentioned, many diagnoses will need multiple interventions throughout a lifetime. Right. And as you can imagine, open heart surgery is, is a very scary thing. And, and many of these children are traumatized by that and, and just live in fear that they'll have to undergo another one. And, one of the most amazing things about the interventional side of things is that we are able to delay and even several times prevent an open heart surgery from ever even happening. And gosh, the technology that we have to replace valves in the heart, we we're actually able to replace all four valves in the heart in certain situations. To be able to do that all through the leg vessel of the arm and prevent them from having open heart surgery, it's it's so rewarding, and to see the relief of the patient and the parents uh, when we allow and enable that option, it truly is an amazing thing to be a part of. Um, you mentioned that a child can need several interventions, yep. and I know it is Heart Month, and we're, we've talked a lot about you know heart transplants as well. And I know that if a child has a heart transplant as a child, they usually have to have an additional one yep. as an adult. How does that work with the interventions that you do? Mm -hmm. If a child has an intervention, you know, as a baby or as a child, is there a, a frequency of, of what they need to do, or? Or you do it once and you're done, or does it depend on the situation? Yeah, sorry, it really depends. Uh, there are certain times where a valve is a little abnormal, we can balloon it as a small baby, and that can last their lifetime. Um, there are certainly other times, taking that same example, where we balloon it as a child, and then we're able to put a valve in later, and maybe they need a surgery later. So it really depends on the underlying situation. But just understand that congenital heart disease necessitates a huge team. I mean, this is by no means is this just me doing things. I mean, everything from surgeons to interventional cardiologists to cardiologists to care for these kids pre and post-op and um, nurses. I mean, there, there's so many respiratory therapists. There's so much of a big team to take care of this population that uh, it really takes a multidisciplinary approach.
You mentioned that a kid can come in with a broken arm that you've worked on, right? Yeah. So, and we talked about life expectancy, but what is life like for children with congenital heart defect setting and intervention? Can they play sports? Are they, they they're living yeah. normal, healthy, everyday yeah. lives? Absolutely. And again, I, I think every single pediatric cardiologist, that's their number one goal to make sure that we are allowing these children to do anything that they want to do. Now, there are there are times where we have to restrict kids. That, I would say, is the more rare uh, aspect. Or, but the, for the vast majority of kids, they are able to live full lives, play sports, do anything they want. You may know uh, some of the professional athletes. A, a very, very outspoken person about his congenital heart disease is Sean White, the professional snowboarder. Oh, really? And yeah, he had a, a, a very common type of congenital heart disease called Tetralogy of Fallot, and uh, he's had multiple surgeries and interventions. And of course, he's at the peak performance. Yeah. He's an incredible athlete. So he, these children and these patients, they're warriors. They go through a lot, but man, they can do a lot. They are heart warriors, as we <laughs> talked about. Uh, we have a little, just a couple more minutes, but sure. um, somebody asked if a child is diagnosed with general heart defect, what is, like, what is the process of care? Yeah. So, so what is the process? Or if somebody's watching and they, they need to have their child evaluated, can it take us through this step? Absolutely. So I, I think that always, if, if there's a parent, and we'll talk about the scenario with it's a little baby. Uh, and we talked about some of the things, maybe they're not gaining weight, maybe their coloration is off. You know, always go to your pediatrician first, your primary care provider, okay. if, if it's not an emergency. Of course, if it's an emergency and something's going on, then trust your gut because parents, mom's intuition is too great. I mean, if you know something's wrong, go to an emergency room, right. especially somewhere like Judy that has specialists in pediatric care, and they can really expedite a, a referral to either a pediatric cardiologist if they feel like that, that those red flags for congenital heart disease really are, red for, are taken up and that we really need to evaluate quickly. So I think that it depends. If it's emergent, go to the emergency room. But for the most part, start with your pediatrician. Express the concerns that you have. And they can really help navigate because if they feel like it's urgent and that, yes, there is a concern, then they can easily get them in to see a pediatric cardiologist. And then you mentioned you're not going to do a heart workup on every baby, but a heart workup in, like, you know, if you comment, what does that include? Does that include EKGs? What type of test? Yeah, good question. So I think certainly EKG, like you mentioned, that's looking at the electricity of the heart, but then also an, an ultrasound, kind of like when the baby was inside a mom's womb, we do ultrasounds. We can do ultrasounds that's outside the body, looking at the heart anatomy or the plumbing, like I talked about, that, to make sure the plumbing hooks, is hooked up right. And so um, that's usually where we start. Now, there's certainly other um, uh, diagnostic procedures. I, I, many of my catheterizations are just diagnostic, to take pictures, to look at things, to measure pressures and uh, with a little plastic tube inside the heart. So there's lots of things that we can do uh, in addition, but we start usually with an echo and you Got it. All right. So if a child is, you know, experiencing symptoms or a parent doesn't know, obviously go to your pediatrician. We also have our website, jdch.com, slash services, slash cardiac, where you can read all about it. I was just checking to see if we have any more questions, but I think we covered them all. So is there anything else you want to mention? I know you have to get back to uh, surgery and you're super busy today, but is there anything else you'd like to tell anybody about congenital heart defect? No, I, I just think that, again, awareness is everything. I mean, although... You may not know someone with congenital heart disease. You have to realize that there are lots of people walking around every day and, and uh, maybe playing sports, maybe on the bus with you or whatever with congenital heart disease. And so I think awareness is very important. And, um, you know, there's a lot of resources out there. If your child does have congenital heart disease and you're watching this, there's groups, groups of parents and groups nationally as well as internationally that really kind of help plug you into resources of things like, hey, what to do in regards to COVID if my child has right. uh, CHD. So there's resources out there and make sure that, um, you know, we as providers really need to enable our population to, again, live their best quality of life. And, and we've done a great job of developing those resources. So they're out there and just ask. Yeah, and they're on the website again, jdch.com slash services slash cardiac. Thank you so much yeah. for doing this. We thank really you. appreciate it. That's and thank you so much for watching at home. Again, please share this broadcast with your friends, and uh, we appreciate you being here. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye-bye.